Good. So I've already forgotten which session this is. So a very warm welcome to whatever number this is. It may be number seven. Seven? Yeah, good. So welcome to this seventh session in this undefined number of uh, teachings on the third Jawa Kamapas Mahamudra prayer or prayer of or path of aspirant, if we give it its proper title, path of aspirations for Mahamudra, the definitive meaning. So let's start as we always do, and we must do, with our excellent motivation and sort of easing out of our usual manic busyness and preoccupation with ourselves and letting our mind remember that we're part of everyone and everything. And we are a very, very, very interesting part of everyone and everything. Just now, our whatever we are is very activated. We have what's called a precious human birth. And there are billions and zillions of other parts of the everything that don't. Uh, so it's a wonderful, very special opportunity to use before death throws us back into the everything and whatever comes next, <laughs> which may be lots and lots of nexts before we get back here. It's beautiful to be alive, to have the Dharma, to have all of these circumstances so wonderfully coming together that we can sense and feel and take in these teachings about basic goodness, ultimate goodness, sanity, stability, clarity, purity, everything we could ever wish for. So let's include everybody, but very especially those with whom we have our karmic connections this time round. They're part of us, they're part of our mind, they're part of our karma. And so then let's think of everyone with as much love as we can possibly muster on the moment and with great joy of Dharma. Sonje chodon soje chonama jancho bado dane chapsen che tagi jinso jipe sonom je trona penchera sonje druparan sho semchen tamche dewa dong dewe jodang den paran joche dongal dong dongal je jodang tralwara joche Tongal me pe de wa tong pa dong men chal wa re ju chi ni ren cha dan ne tan chal we tan yong chen bo la ne pa re ju le chi do ji chang chen ta lo na ro dong ma pa me la ju chi kang bo pa du sum ji cha kun chen kang ma pa ji shi chun ji ju pa zin lang tong ri ta so sun ta den ju pa so Zablam chaja chelaina ni pein yame jokan japo ka jula so wan dip so ka jula mana Jupa zeno nam tere jinji lo sheno gongji kampare zumba shen zeno kun ma cha shen me pa dhama se di da ta cha pi kum chenna Ne kura shen pa me pa re jinji lo mogu gongji gobara zumba shen me ma te go jipi na mana jindu so wan dip e pum chenna Chunen <laughs> Deya tai shame shamawati shame tai shachu Am kuri mam kuri mare jite karuta ke yori te juwati Ollo yani bishu danyamale 
Malapanaye kukore ka ka grase grasana O muke para muke a muke shame dawane sawa draha bandana nengre hitwa sawa bara prawa dina bimukta mara basha savitwa buddha mudra Anod katita sawa mare putsarita parishu debiga shantu sawa mara kama Halden sawe lama rinpoche, dagye chivora pende den shura. Karin chempo gone jesonte, kuson tuche madrup sandu swar. So let's um, locate ourselves. Let's do a bit of geolocation within this prayer. And we are now entering into the details. Uh, in verse 8, we had view, meditation, action, and a prayer to gain confidence in them. And we saw what, how, how vital this is for any practice, any religion, any school. We need to know the view, um, meditation, and action. That was verse 8. Now, then verse 9 focuses on the view. So we go a bit deeper into the view. All phenomena, yeah, all phenomena are illusory displays of the mind. Mind is no mind, devoid of any mind essence. It is void, yet unceasing, manifesting as anything whatsoever. After careful examination, may the ground and root of everything be realized. So that's the view. And last time we entered into, how can you say, some understanding of that. Now, uh, today, um, you know, like when we do Mahamudra, we have to start with Mundra, a bit of preparation, a bit of groundwork, some foundation work. Before we can go into verse 10, then I think we need to do a bit of preparation work, some groundwork. And I need to say, or sort of to make clear what we're doing. We're having a quick look at a prayer, right? I've been with this prayer for what, almost 50 years. I'm still discovering it. Just a prayer, 24 verses. And uh, each week, as I consider what to say, uh, new doors open for me. The same will happen for you. And this is just a prayer about Mahamudra, which is the real deal. It's the practice. What I'm not doing, what I can't do, what is absolutely impossible, is to give you Mahamudra instructions about any of these points. So like with the view, I can't just do a talk and that's it. We're all happy. We've all got our heads around the view. And what do we go on to next? The view will take you the rest of your life. And then it will be not a philosophical discovery. You can go that way. But mainly if you're practicing Mahamudra, it will be in dialogue with your teacher that gradually your way of seeing things is what we mean by the view, the way you experience life, your view of it, your view of people, the projections on everything. That view will shift through meditation instructions, practices your teacher gives you. And very, very importantly, 
through the nandro, through the foundation practices. They are, you know, this analogy they have of turning a big ship around in the ocean. <laughs> that ship is you and all your history. <laughs> uh, you can't just flip it like a Swedish rally driver's handbrake turn of a car. <laughs> we need the Mundro, the foundation work. Uh, in order to gradually, gradually change the whole power of our karma. Turn it usefully into a good direction. It's like catching the water of a mountain waterfall to turn it into hydroelectric power. So the point I'm making is, I'm just telling you about what's going on in this prayer. And the prayer is telling us about what's going on in Mahamudra practice. I hope it's frustrating. Because if you think I've understood it all and that's it, then uh, something's not right. This should be opening so many question marks in your mind. Such a, a longing to understand you know, what I say and what tickles your spiritual mind a little bit. You should want to scratch it. <laughs> you should want to do something with it. That's what I hope. So I need to tell you that because these verses that we're getting into, they touch on subjects that are so deep and can be so complicated when we follow philosophy, Buddhist philosophy and all the schools and the Tibetans. You never get to the end of it. I mean, great minds, forget about us. Dalai Lamas, Kamapas, Sakya leaders, Geluk, uh, Nimapa leaders. They don't agree. And they're brilliant. And they've got so much meditation practice under their belt. So there's no way Ken Holmes can just sort this out for you. I need to tell you that. So that's one thing. And then the Mundro for today, I did send you one support document for, and another one I didn't send, but I'll put it on screen. So those, uh, so uh, then I didn't welcome those of you who are watching this on YouTube, but welcome to you. Um, if you're watching on YouTube and you've not registered for these teachings, uh, then please email and you can get the support documentation. So now uh, what I sent out was this. Can somebody wave if you can see it? Yeah, good. Okay. So in the coming verse, and in all of Mahamudra and Mahamudra texts and teachings, then uh, we have what in English you'll find as mind in translations. It says mind, and then depending on the translator, sometimes it says your own mind, sometimes it says not your own mind, but mind itself. But generally, there is this word mind. So if you've read the support document I sent out, you'll know what I'm about to say, but I need to say it here. Um, there are more words in Tibetan and in Sanskrit that nearly all translators mind. In particular, if you look at the bottom of this diagram, you'll see three key words, manas, citta, and vijana. These all went into Tibetans, into Tibetan, and so you get uh, Lo and Sem and Yi and Namshi and so on. You get a few words, but Tibetans themselves say it's not clear. Uh, generally, in the texts, any of those words, Manas Chitta Vijana, means mind, mind, talking about mind. Sometimes they are clearly defined, but only sometimes and not always systematically the same. 
So for translators like myself, or for somebody really trying to understand what texts are saying, this is something you need to know. If you're reading English translations and you see mine, what was that originally? So uh, just to speak very briefly, Chitta is the main word for mind. It's Sem in Tibetan. And how can you say it's, it's the bit of you that is really aware of what's going on and the bit of you that decides things, chooses your path, makes decisions and so on, makes choices. It's kind of the key bit of you, Chitta. Vijana is straightforward functioning, it's consciousness, it's impressions coming into your mind moment after moment, something to see, something to hear, something to taste, in the five senses, or it's a memory, or it's a fantasy, it's a future plan, imagination. But the raw experience. So that's uh, Vijana. Manas, sometimes, it's means what we've created, what we've created through karma, what we've created by way of habits, the habitual way we respond, we interpret the vijana, the consciousness messages. So uh, we, know we make all kind of mental associations with things and so on. So the baggage of karma and the habits of reactivity and so on, sometimes Sometimes that's more the manas aspect of things, but they all end up as mind in English very often. Now, taken all together, then manas chitta vijana, it's everything which is your personal stream of consciousness, samsara. The quality, if we can call it that, of samsara is that everything in there is impermanent. There's always some suffering involved, not necessarily obvious suffering, but you know, we study the three types of suffering, suffering when it actually hurts, suffering through change, and then innate suffering just through being embodied, through being reborn, wherever it is, through karma. Anyway, there's always suffering. And then there's always a false identity. Uh, so it's your identity, it's my identity, it's what we identify with as me. But it's an illusion. And it's an illusion we see we can change. It's an arbitrary personality force identity. So now at the top of the diagram, we have Buddha mind, or the purity of our mind. Now, whereas consciousness is called Vijana, and actually the V means divided, split up into sections, specific, focused on something, the purity of mind has jhana, primordial wisdom. It's changeless. This is enormous once you start thinking about it. The ultimate truth or Buddha, it just is, and the way it is, always has been, always will be absolutely changeless. It's mind boggling. There's no suffering there, not even a trace. And it is who we truly are. So this is the true identity. Now, in past talks, I've mentioned these as being, how can you say, two realities running parallel with each other. In this diagram, I've not put a line between them. They're kind of in the same space the purity of mind. Um, just a second. 
second. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting a message that uh, I might be touching something and getting uh, problems with my microphone. Yeah. Mm. Just a moment. Okay, if it gets really bad, please let me know. Uh, no. Yeah, so anyway, that's about words about mind. So um, please keep this in mind. <laughs> and that there are these two, I mean, they're just so different. And Buddha Maitreya says, there is not one atom of commonality between the samsaric mind, this unending, changing flow of personal consciousness, not one atom the same between that and Buddha mind. Just now we have them both. As we remove, erase bit by bit the stream of consciousness mind, the Buddha mind will start to shine through. So let me finish with that one. Um, so that's one part of the homework we need to know about the word mind. Now I want to develop that a little bit further. On this one, I didn't send you um, a diagram. Yeah, it's here. Okay, can you see a diagram there? Yep, good. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. can I do that? There. So this is about the eight consciousnesses. And in uh, a course quite some time ago, we spent good quality time understanding these. So this uh, are the eight main aspects of this stream of consciousness that we are, that I often refer to. The eighth consciousness is called storehouse consciousness it makes it sound too solid like it's something you could find or explore uh, so i've put it as a treasure chest uh, it's got all sparkly things in it now this is where all of our karma is in fact if we speak about it more truthfully it's not a place where something is because nobody ever saw it but karma somehow we make in one lifetime and it comes up in future lifetimes. That's just how it works. In the meantime, where it is, the sort of storehouse, warehouse is not a place we can go to unless we have a very, very, very skilled and enlightened mind. Sometimes we get little flashes of past life, past deeds, but it's not a very accessible place you can go to. So we're looking more at the very fact or the ability of the mind, citta, manas, vijana, the ability of the mind to store results from our actions. One thing, so we do an action and then the result comes up in the future life. It's a potential that's stored. It's like uh, a magnetic tape that's programmed, that's recorded on. The other thing is ongoing and our habits of emotions, thinking, projection, uh, they are being revised and reprogrammed all the time. But the very fact that it carries on from one day to the next and the next is due to the eighth consciousness. So it's more like not another consciousness, but an ability of the mind. Now, when karma is made and habits are made, they have different strengths and the way the mind works, which is amazing. 
is that some take priority over others. It's like they push themselves to the front of the queue. Or if you've ever had to queue up for something, sometimes it's like priority for pregnant women or elderly people, or you know, if you've got a certain kind of a pass, you can go straight to the front of the queue. So some karmas automatically come to the head of the queue and strong habits and also strong mind imprints, trauma or blessing. They can prioritize themselves. So this quality of the mind to put the next thing on screen on, of our mind is called the seventh consciousness. It's not a separate thing, it's more a quality, a power of the mind. So seventh consciousness, which I put as a kind of clown juggler, and which you might think of as like the script writers in the sky, or um, however you think of somebody out there doing it to you, or writing the story, but it's karma. So that seventh consciousness does two things. It closes down the last moment and brings on the next one. That's one thing. It's like the master of ceremonies. Take away that thought, bring on the next thought. Take away this focus of our awareness, bring on the next one. In a larger sense, uh, okay, you're 21 and a half years old now. Let's bring on this karma. Let's bring this person into your life for the next 11 and a half years and so on. Seventh consciousness ends realities and brings on new ones in the moment or overlapping over minutes, years, lifetimes. That's one thing. The other thing it does, and that we'll be looking at in the next verse, is whatever is brought on screen is split into two, into an illusion of two-sidedness, me and you subject and object, something being experienced, someone experiencing it. And that raw split into two that the seventh consciousness does, it just splits it into two, into an illusion of two, that's all, seventh consciousness. And then sixth consciousness is the one that builds up stories on that split. So that's the second part of our And draw. Okay. Yeah. Just getting back with you. Good. I'm uh, sorry, there's a lot of uh, moon draw, a lot of preliminaries to do today. Uh, so that was the second, second. Now, the third one I've mentioned before, but I'm going to mention it again. Uh, and it's this. It's as our Dharma practice develops, we need to distinguish in all of that play of consciousness, the eight consciousnesses, we need to distinguish two things so that we can realize clearly what's going on in ourselves. One is direct experience. That the seventh consciousness, remember the clown, the juggler, that brings on each moment, that clown is going to pull out of the box of eighth consciousness poof, the next moment, and you're experiencing it. You'll be seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or remembering, whatever it is, it will just be the experience. That's one thing. The second thing is how we rationalize that experience to ourselves, how we tell the story. In this life, you can see it with kids growing up. At first, they don't have a story to tell. Um, and something colored and moved and so on. And then 
they learn language. And you see the little ones sounding just like their mum and their dad and using the terminology they've learned and gradually using the limited terminology to expand their ideas and terminology and then to learn to phrase things and as that develops over the years then the past comes in. They learn how to explain to themselves what's going on in their direct experience. They build up their own stories of the world around them. So there is the direct experience and there is the rationalization. They are two very different things. The direct experience, we have very limited room for maneuver. It's karma. What this seventh consciousness is bringing on screen each moment is so much determined by karma. But the story we tell ourselves about it, we can change. So much of Dharma is about that. Not only that, with good meditation, we can stop telling any story. And that's really good. And it's a very, very enlightening experience because once we stop telling any story, then we have much more lucidity about the various stories we are telling ourselves about other people, about ourselves, about everything, about life. We need to separate those two. So now, after all of that, blah, 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 rationalization, direct experience and blah, blah. Like I just spent half an hour, sounds, words, it makes sense, it makes structures. And at the same time, you were looking at a screen where there are shapes and colors and sounds. And maybe if you're a bit spaced out, you can't follow the sounds anymore. It's just sounds. And then there's these things going on on the screen. But we put it together with reason, with logic, through habit. So now let's go to our verses. So we are looking at the view and in the view and then there are three things we need to remember from the last talk because it's how it's the steps of how you will develop your view. You won't get it from a philosophy book or from a philosophy course. In the actual practice of Mahamudra, you need to go through three stages. The time it takes depends on your karma and your diligence. The first one is you need to be absolutely 100% convinced that everything is mind. We did that last time. In the second stage, once you are convinced that everything is mind, you need to explore what is mind. Not think about it in meditation, direct practice, your mind. What's just now in Ken Holmes' talk, this mind that's thinking about things and learning and reacting. What, what is it? Where is it? First, we need to know that everything is mind. That's not clear. We tend to think of everything as very separate. We tend to think of mind as my mind and so on. We need to understand everything is mind. And then to explore mind, to find you can't find it. It's what we call devoid of any own nature. And then once you've looked and looked and you keep coming again and again, to, can't find anything. It's like trying to catch a phantom. It's like trying to pick up quicksilver, mercury. Now, this is actual practice, huh? Mahamudra practice with your teacher's instructions. And it says, if you see in a later verse, yang yang ten la, sem la te pise. When you look at mind, you need to look again and again 
a thousand times, ten thousand times, a hundred thousand times. It's, it reminds me of something that Kempo Tsenan said. He was a very, very great doctor about the Tibetan way of taking pulses. He said, I think you need to have taken the pulse of about 10,000 patients before you really understand it and are good at it. 10,000 patients. So in our discovery that mind is no mind, which is what it says, then we need again and again and again in the living moment of meditation to try and find the mind that's doing it, try and catch it, try and take a picture of it. You know, like when you have a camera and you've got magic moments, yeah, I must get a picture of this. It's like the other day, I had my phone in my pocket and I saw a snake, but by the time I got the phone out, the snake had gone away <laughs> too late. So we try and catch it mind and you can't you can't and you can't so the truth of mind's voidness becomes it couldn't be anything else but then in the third step even though nobody ever found it mind is manifesting all the time through the power of karma every moment it's not like oh great you know i did a buddhist meditation i discovered the void my karma's finished it's there waiting for you whenever you come out. Even you go into absorption for two weeks, you come out and your karma is there still on your doorstep. So that was last time, right? Those three steps. Everything's mind. Mind is void. Although mind is void, it is manifesting incessantly. We must understand those three steps of our journey. So now, in the next four verses, we're going to have one verse that develops each line of verse nine. So one verse for each line. So verse 10 is about all phenomena are illusory displays of the mind. So it's it's this. Chunam tamche semji nam trute semni semme semji mowotong tongshing manga chi yang nawate lek paratang ne shitsa chabarashu. Mind manifestations with no real existence are deludedly taken for objects. Through ignorance, innate awareness is mistaken for a self. Under the sway of this dualistic perception, one wanders in the maze of existence. May ignorance and delusion be decisively exposed. So the first line, and so this is it now, verse 10. We're not going to unpack verse 10 with another four verses. This is as much into detail as we go. We're unpacking the line of the previous verse, which says all phenomena are illusory displays of the mind. It's a short line. Think about it, please. All phenomena, not some, all. Whatever you know in this life, the stuff you see on the news, on the TV, places you've been, anything you can experience out there and in here, in your heart, in your mind, in your feelings, Everything, everything are displays of the mind. First, they are all mind. And then the display of the mind. This mind, how does it work? Why are you experiencing your unique reality 
right now. We're what, 50 people watching this. There are 50 Zoom shows going on. <laughs> there really are. There really are. Your mind is displaying an experience of a Ken Holmes talk, which because of every way you're hearing each word, its associations with your history, the way you're reacting to that emotionally, how much you've studied or not studied, and so on and so on. The display of the mind. So everything is the display of you know, mind. Not the mind, not your mind. It's very hard to know what to say, mind. Manas, chitta, vijana, mind. And then it says are illusory displays of the mind. So not only is it unique to you, but uh, in Buddhist terms, we are each, how can you say, put it nicely, subjective. Put it not so nicely, deluded. Um, so what we're doing in our Buddhist path is trying to find the truth. Hmm? Trying to find the truth. So then, I think in previous talks and in other courses, and then through your own reading, you will uh, know something about the views, uh, the Chittamatrim views, all his mind, and so on. But now we're talking about Mahamudra, where through practice, we have to practice to the point where we are crystal clear that hmm, everything is mind. Not your mind. Not the mind with a capital M. That's where it gets tricky. But certainly, Everything is mind. So it's really, for me, so helpful to have two resources for these teachings. One is the Eighth Taisitupa's commentary to this verse, which is beautifully complicated. And it draws on so many spiritual quotations. It gradually paints a picture and supports it in all sorts of ways, through logic, through citing, and so on, why everything should be mind. And in particular, why, because that's the difficult bit, why what we perceive as other. I mean, of course, your feelings are mind, and your thoughts are mind, and so on, memories, fantasies. But then the question is, what provokes these experiences and what are other people in terms of you and their lives and their karma. So the eighth Taisitupa, to explain his commentary, would take 12, 14 sessions just for that commentary on one verse. It's very thorough. And then the other resource I have is the present Taisitupa's teaching on this verse, where he's teaching and he knows that the, most of the audience are not going to be able to follow the sophistications of the philosophical arguments. But he really wants to dispel some of the basic misunderstandings. And so, um, So what he's saying is everything is mind, but of course that doesn't mean everything is your mind. So I think I explained this already last time and the time before. Uh, what we need to get our head around, our mind around, 
is the fact that we are one tiny part of an endless number of realities and sentient beings. We are like one link in a weave where two threads cross, connected to everyone else, but we are that at the moment, that little bit of reality. So it's not that even though you experience Ukraine and Putin and planet Earth and 21st century, uh, it's not that all of those are just your mind's fantasies. You did, and I want to reassure you, you did not create President Putin. You know. uh, but, but your own karma and your own karmic habits of interpretation have created what President Putin is for you in your mind. And we can't get out of our mind. You know, it's like being in a submarine. You've got a periscope. You've got means to kind of get messages from the outside. But we can't climb outside of our mind to check that reality is what it seems to be like inside our mind. What would you experience it with if you could climb out your mind? Leave your mind aside for a moment. You wouldn't have a mind to go and experience, would you? There's no way out. We only take this story of consciousness that we've evolved over thousands of lifetimes and that reached this point. It's all we can take to these mind experiences coming in. But for us, um, mother, father, brother, sister, children, enemies, friends, country, the queen, all those things. So Taisudupa made it very clear. He says, when it says mind, and everything is mind, then it doesn't mean just your mind. He says, we are infinitely connected. Infinitely connected. So then we get the next two lines. Through ignorance, innate awareness is mistaken for a self. Innate awareness is mistaken for a self. And under the sway, that's uh, um, yeah, sorry. So mind manifestations are taken for objects and the awareness of them is mistaken for a self. So, sorry, I got a bit distracted there because I want to share something else. So like I said, this isn't Mahamudra instructions, but I think we need tiny, tiny, tiny little samples. Otherwise, as uh, we're just in abstract thought, it's not very good. So. Can you see the blue ellipse? Yes, I'm good. Yes, thank you. So I'd like you to look at this. Uh, it's not, it's, I'm not hypnotizing you, by the way. Um, don't worry. Um, so now remember, there are two aspects to our mind. There is direct experience. So just now, if your eyes are open and you're looking at the screen, you have this direct blueness coming on. And then the other part is the storytelling, the rationalization. And labels, even words like blue, ellipse. So as you look at it, as you look at it, 
The storytelling part of your mind tells you that you are looking at it, that thing in front of you. But now sit in the actual experience. Are there two sides? Is there a this side looking? Is there a that side seen? Or is there just this blue ellipse in mind? So we can uh, talk about that afterwards in the discussion. Um, but when we do uh, practice with our moment by moment reality, and then when we apply insight instructions from our guru in Mahamudra, then we see, we come to see each moment in the living reality. that although the rationalizing storytelling part of mind says there has to be, or it tells us, no, you've got an eye, you've got a visual cortex, you've got light waves coming off the screen, and all that has to be, it tells us with strong explanations what's happening. Actually, when in the direct experience, did you find two sides? So uh, it says, under the sway, under the sway, under the power of this dualistic perception, one wanders in the maze of existence. Under the sway of this dualistic perception, so subject and object, direct experience. You are doing this to me. You just said to me that. You and I, interaction, karma. We make karma because of the way we define somebody else, the way we define ourselves, our needs, our possessions, and so on. Fair, unfair, all of that. The storytelling, the rationalization that we put onto the direct experience. So under the sway, under the power, sometimes the irrepressible power, we can't irresistible power of the dualistic perception. Now we need to explore the word perception here. Perception means labeling, storytelling. Under the power of that, we make karma. Then karma, the eighth consciousness, what's in our karmic box, will be pulled on screen by seventh consciousness when the triggers are right in a future life. And then that will be a direct experience. Under the sway of the dualistic storytelling, we make karma and that produces the direct vivid experience that gives us an opportunity to purify our karma or make even more karma. It's very powerful. It's the whole story of life. People who are hurting each other, killing each other, species which are exploiting each other, all of that maze of suffering starts with this split into two and then telling the story of who I am 
in this and what's going on out there who she is, who he is, what they are doing, what the world is doing, what the government's doing, and so on, and so on. It will never end all by itself. It keeps itself going. That's the nature of samsara, unless we put a stop to it. So in Mahamudra, what we are going to do is to go to the very root and heart of the problem. So in the last line, it says, may ignorance and delusion be decisively exposed. Decisively exposed is a translation. When you look at the Tibetan, shi tsa chopa. Shi means the basis, tsa means the root, and chopa means to really cut through to it. In Mahamudra, rather than, there's an analogy of a, a tree with many, many branches, a huge tree and sub-branches. It says we can work on, it's not a very nice analogy, but we can cut off little branch by little branch and bigger branch by bigger branch. But we can also just slice it at the bottom of the trunk and the whole thing comes tumbling down. So in Mahamudra, and what we are praying for in this verse, is to get to the root of the matter, which is the way the mind splits into two. And it really feels alien, like other people are, other circumstances are, other. It's out there, it's not you, and you are inside here experiencing it. There is no easy way to explain what's going on. It's easy to understand shunyata, what's meant by shunyata. It's easy. To understand what's going on that makes your unique life, my unique life, what it is, moment by moment, experience by experience, to understand the karma and how we've got these two things, infinite other beings, the whole universe out there. And we're interpreting it all subjectively. So it's all mind. It's not as though there are material people out there and a material universe out there. Those other people are mind. The universe is mind. We are mind. It's all mind. But it's mistakenly taken for other objects. And then through ignorance, our awareness, like our awareness of that blue space, our awareness of another person, of life's reality, that awareness is mistaken for a me. We've all got it just now. It's your the best part of you, your intelligence, your awareness, what's alive just now, understanding, taking in the information. So in everyday language, we say that's the best bit of you. So we need to explore, and this is what Mahamudra practice that becomes to in future verses, helps us to do. What is this intelligence? So what we'll see in coming verses is that we need first to really settle the mind in shamatha. So you've got a laboratory. Your mind's not all over the place and out of control. Our number seven consciousness, you know, the clown who's a juggler. We give the clown a sleeping tablet. Well, the clown just, he's out, out for the count for a while. Sort of, sort of. I'm just being funny. It's not technically absolutely correct. But instead of all sorts of things coming in another thought and another memory, and another experience, and then you're listening to that, and then you're feeling your tummy rumbling, and then oh, you're thinking, oh, maybe this is some kind of internal chakra energy, and it never stops. All of that. And then we have a 
calm, controlled, where for minutes on end, your mind is still. And in there with your grace from the, your guru's instructions, so perfectly tailored to you, then this intelligence, this awareness that we are, we can feel it. Be at one with it, explore it. So, uh, I don't know really what more to say about this verse. The come up in this verse is stating the facts of the matter. At the moment, our whole habit is dualistic. Through that, we make an outer world, a feeling of inner self. And now this is two words, delusion and ignorance. Ignorance means what it says. We are ignoring. We are not knowing our true nature, the true nature of mind, the Buddha. Never change, never, never changes. All the blessing is in there. All the Buddha Kayas, all the manifestations of pure lands and deities, peaceful Buddhas, wrathful Buddhas. We are ignoring that. So ignorance, and because we ignore the truth, then we are deluded by the two-sided me and you story that has created itself so strongly over the years and over the lifetimes. So our prayer is for um, is to get to the root of that, to get to the real heart of the matter. Now, the next verse, verse 11, which we start today, is what unpacks line 2 of verse 9. So verse 10 unpacked line 1 of verse 9. Verse 11 unpacks line 2 of verse 9. Mind, so that second line is, mind is no mind. Uh-oh, can just spend... 20 minutes telling you about mind, citta, vijana, manas, pure Buddha mind, deluded samsaric mind, blah, 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 rationalizing mind, direct experience, mind. Mind is no mind. Devoid of any mind essence. So that's Yopa Mayan Jawe Jamazik, Mepa Mayan Kode Kunjishi, Galdu Mayan Zonjo Gumelam, Tatra Semji Chuni Toparisho. So that next verse is doesn't exist, even the Buddhas haven't, haven't seen it. It does not not exist, it's the basis for all samsara. It's not a contradiction, but it's the way of union. May the dharmata be realized, which is free from any extremes. Yopa Mayin Jawe Jomazi, a very famous verse, this one. Uh, mind. So let's imagine we've all just spent a five year retreat together on uh, what I've just been talking about. And very vivid. Now, you, now it's five years have gone by, okay? And you've become quite expert. You can see, oh yeah, that's consciousness, visual consciousness here and see, that's that. And then this is my mind, what it wants to create out of all of that. And yes, this is seventh consciousness bringing this on screen. 
and so on and so on. And then you've learned about the Bodhisattva levels, extensive teachings about what mind means for them, and so on and so on. And so, and then we're doing Mahamudra together. And we come to the point where, what is this mind that's producing your story? What's doing it? And we start the hunt. We could do, was it Yuri Jella with one of those spoons or somebody challenging Yuri Jella who put a spoon inside a glass sphere and challenged anyone to bend it. <laughs> And I think there was, what, a million dollar prize? Nobody got it yet. We could make a hundred million dollar prize, if any of you have got that much to spare, for anyone who finds mind. Because what the Kamapa tell us, tells us is that mind is no mind. Even the Buddhas never found it. Jawa Jama Sik says, even Buddhas never found it. Never found something, you could say. Now, so this is all quite serious and intense. I'd like to tell you a story. Uh, actually, it was uh, Kempo Labu Drupal Rinpoche who told it to me from the time he was in Tibet. And he said he had a friend and uh, he was, he had a group of, he was teaching Mahamudra to, and uh, he gave some instructions about the nature of mind, about how it's, how can you say, radiant and so on like this. And people were looking for their mind. And he had one disciple who, to put it bluntly, wasn't too bright. <laughs> and he came back really thrilled. He said, I found my mind. I found my mind, Kempola. And so, or Rinpoche, or whatever he called him. And the Rinpoche, who kind of knew him, he said, really? Oh, tell me, tell me about it. He said, well, I was walking across a stream. So I took my shoes off and I hoisted up my shantap, the lower rope. And I was about halfway across and I saw it in the water, shining so brightly. And I thought, that's it. This is the essence of my mind. <laughs> and he said, and I picked it up and put it in my top robe. It's where Tibetans keep things. I wanted to bring it back and show it to you. But then I slipped and it fell out and I couldn't find it. But I did find it for a while. <laughs> You will never find anything wherever you look, whether it's in a stream or a mountain or in the sky or inside meditation, where you can say, that's my mind. That is mine. Nothing that is a something. Not necessarily a material something. It's just where you can say, that's it. You can fix it. Or like the essence of your mind, an essence. Here it gets interesting. Yeah. If a teacher sat down, he came in and said, okay, now let's all meditate on the... I told you, okay, meditate on the essence of your mind, nature of your mind. How many people would try and do something special? As though there was some something, some special experience. But uh, you know, nature of mind, just don't, give me a moment. <laughs> I'm almost there, just a minute, give me a bit more. That's it. Oh, yeah. Oh. 
<laughs> Not even the Buddhas ever found. They didn't find it and lose it. It's not that they might find it tomorrow. There is nothing, nothing, no thing specific, which is mind. And that's all this is saying. That's why in the previous verse, we need to explore everything is mind. In, in other words, mind's another word for everything. Put it that way. The everything. everything. So mind is no mind. There's not anything, anything, any state. And especially there is no essence of mind, which would be uh, essentially what the mind is, that's what an essence is, other than all the rest of it. You never find, Buddha's never. Now, even now, as beginners, we can get this straight. We know that whatever meditation practice we're doing in Mahamudra, we are not looking for a state or a something. So you could, how much time have I got? Five minutes. It's quite a lark teaching this stuff, honestly. Uh, there's some vital part of our practice. You've got to do it. It's remedial voidness. You've got to apply voidness teachings as a remedy. Why? Because we are drunk. We are drunk with samsara. We need to sober up. You know, we need to go out there to breathe fresh air, to drink strong coffee, to take an Alka-Seltzer or whatever you're going to do, so that bit by bit you can come out of this drunken state. So there is remedial voidness. Why? What are we remedying? Stickiness. The way that we are glued into it. It's like you've super glued yourself into ideas assumptions about people, assumptions about life, a whole way of telling the story. The story comes on screen every moment. Seventh consciousness is bringing it up, like it or not, like it or not. Do you think the Dalai Lama wanted to be chased out of Tibet? Do you think the 17th Kamapa wanted the obstacles that he's had to his life? Seventh consciousness will bring up karma again and again. Akon Rinpoche was murdered. He told me every time before he left for Tibet, if it's my karma to die there, if it's my karma to die there, I'll die there. And he did. He did one year. So the direct experience will keep coming, like it or not. How you tell the story about that through the force of habit can be changed. So everything's mind. And we can't say that because we never found it and Buddha's never found it. And each moment when we try and capture the blue color, the blue sphere, when you try and capture a feeling of what's going on in the moment, there's nothing to be found. That nothing to be found is so precious. So it says that even though there is no mind to be found as a thing. Look. And then language leaves us crippled. To use language, I have to say, something is creating this whole samsaric experience. It has to be. It is so precise. Buddha teaches it in such detail. You do this, that'll happen. That's how it works. This is how karma works. You do it this way, you do it with strong intention, and so on and so on. 
then it will produce that. There is this ability to imprint this stream of consciousness, as we call it, mind. And that produces my experience and in the minds of others and the whole way we interact in this endless fabric of being. So it says, de kunjishi. So it says it's not just the basis of all samsara, it's the basis for nirvana as well. So we need to understand that. Maybe next time. Uh, but you, just a clue or a teaser for the next program <laughs> is uh, nirvana is not something. It says it's the basis for samsara and nirvana. Nirvana is not a state. Nirvana simply means no more suffering, the end of suffering. So as we get out of the power of suffering, remember it said under the power of su power of these things, under the sway, as we get out, there is more and more freedom. This is the gradual Nirvana, step by step, four main stages, stream entrant, one time returner, non returner, arhat, and so on. But so that we call liberation, path to liberation, our Dharma journey. We wouldn't need that Dharma journey if we weren't stuck in the suffering. So there's suffering, samsara, and getting out the suffering, nirvana. Mind, what we generally call mind, is the basis for all that. That's what it says. It's the basis, ko de kun, samsara, nirvana, kun. All of it, ji, is the basis. Again, we're not talking about philosophy. Philosophy can't cope here, quite honestly. We're talking about your own meditation experience in Mahamudra practice, whereby again and again you will find the voidness of mind and you will come to marvel at how there's nothing there you can find. Nothing. Not even an atom. Nothing you can find to say, this is my mind. But nevertheless it manifests. Come up in a later verse, he calls it the mystery of mind. It's the most beautiful, most powerful mystery there ever was. And we can only crack that mystery through meditation. A very good meditation, very diligent, thorough, well guided meditation. So, anyway, that's it for today. We are sort of gradually hacking our way through the jungle of these verses. And I hope it's given you food for thought and uh, that that uh, helps you on your way. Let's dedicate all that was good and useful. Sonam diye tamche zikbane tobne ne pedrana bamche ne je ga nachi parap chukpaye sipe sole drowa drowa rasho Janchob Semcho Rinpoche Majepanam Jejochik Jepan Yampa Me Patan Kong Me Kongdra Palwarasho Gewa Di Nyododa Chajachempo Drukjone Rowa Chikjong Malopa Deye Sala Kaparasho So, uh, thank you. And now, um, what I'll do, if that's okay with everybody, is uh, sometimes the, I find that the discussion we have at the end of uh, the teaching is, uh, is useful, uh, not just for us here, but for others. So, um, in order to keep your sort of image private, um, I just put the sound of the points you make and the questions and my answers. So I'll carry on doing that unless anyone specifically objects. I mean, just now we're seeing each other 
you know, in our rooms, our bedrooms, and in, uh, you, you probably want to keep that private, I think. And then some people are very, very image conscious, but uh, the sound uh, and the questions is, can be very useful. So over to you, if you have uh, anything. I can, I have a, um... A short question of, clarif of reassurance, I think it is. I think, I think the answer is pretty obvious. But when we're saying everything is mind, mm -hmm. and you described earlier citta, vijana, and manas, presumably when we say everything is mind, we're meaning those three, somehow made of those three things in some way, shape, or form. Is that a right mm -hmm. understand? That's right. Um... And the thing that was at the top of the diagram also, when we say Buddha mind, but it's not as though you have to abandon this mind and then find a Buddha mind, which would be something else. All the Buddha nature teachings are that, and that's this why it gives the analogy of sleep and dream. And all the time that we're dreaming, we are the person we are. We could wake up at any moment, the dream would stop. The contents of the dream don't need to go somewhere. You know, the people don't need to go somewhere like actors. The scenery doesn't need to be dismantled. It's always been there, that possibility when you're asleep of waking up. So also the true nature of mind or Buddha mind, we also call mind, pure mind. Uh, so everything is mind. Uh, in the first line of the verse we focused on today, then the main point, the difficult point for other, for people often, is that uh, what seemed to be other is not. So we have the <coughs> five sense consciousnesses. So when what we see looks like we are looking at something else, Whereas what you see, what's being seen, is happening inside you. Let me give you, it's not an example, but let's walk a bit in that direction using everyday science. Right? Just now, you're looking at your screen. So we'd say that uh, light, which is a mixture of vibrations and pro photons is coming from your screen, hitting your eye. It triggers the rods and cones at the back of your eye, which stimulate your optical nerve and make an experience in your visual cortex that another part of your brain is registering if you're mainly looking. So now if we imagine, I'm not, I won't bother putting it back, but that blue shape on the screen. As you were looking at it, were you looking at something else or were you experiencing your own brain, your own visual cortex? What, what, what would you answer? It was an experience in the visual cortex. Of course. Now this is freaky because as we walk around, like you go down high street, you're walking and you realize that all of this is going on inside my brain, you could get very freaked out. I mean, you might need to be hospitalized for a few weeks, <laughs> or you might just want to go back into your car <laughs> and just hang on to something tightly while you digest the experience. But if you just think scientifically, forget about Dharma, Buddhism, you know, what you hear is, you know, and, and then, so that's why it's the same. It's why the Buddha used the dream example. You can dream walking down that high street. It's the same experience. So there, a modern scientific person could understand what's happening in terms of it's my brain, right? They'd use the word brain rather than mind. Uh, when we get actually into brain exploration and uh, this beautiful experience you have just now, 
Look, you can see so many millions of details with your eyes. It's, it's so amazing. The experience itself, we can't find in the brain. You know, you can see this neurons firing. You could go as accurately as you wanted. It might look like the most amazing lightning storm, but it wouldn't be Ken Holmes on a screen. Where's that happening? The actual experience you have right now, this visual experience, where's it happening? If it was in the brain, we could slice your brain open and see it, a Ken Holmes image. You won't, you'll just see electricity or whatever's going, chemical exchanges, little chemicals creeping along. Yes. You won't see this vivid experience. So that's why we talk more about mind than about the brain. Now, especially, ah, you know, people are thinking about the queen who died. She's in her second day of Bardo now, second, second day after death, rather. And now when the mind's not in a body, it can still experience. That's interesting. So when we say everything's mind, uh, a lot of the exploration is about um, what comes in through the five sense consciousnesses and that we generally translate as other and outer. And the feeling is I'm a, a mind that's in a body that can see and hear and so on. And I'm picking up signals from something else. Does that does that help? Sorry, it was a long answer, James. Yes, brilliantly. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. Hi, Ken. Uh, I have I have a question which I thought about not asking this week because it didn't seem to be relevant to the Mahamudra prayer. But much of what you've been talking about today <laughs> seems very relevant, particularly uh, your comments about the eighth and seventh consciousnesses mm. and also the answer you've just given. Um, the question is a bit obscure, but I, I'm interested in this moment when, when we half wake up uh, from dreams um, and we're sort of half back into what we like to think is this real reality. And the mind sort of switches, it's it's half in and half of out of that, and it's going from one to the other. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wonder, how can we use that moment when our normal perception of this really solid reality world out here is somewhat shaken because, <laughs> because we're, going, we're half going back into these weird dreams that we're having? Uh, you know, so it, it's, it's it's not as solid as we like to think we are like now, like the window over here is very much a window, but mm. we're just waking up. It's not necessarily a window. Do you see what I'm getting at? Mm. Is, is there a way we can use that moment of half, half dream, half, half so-called awake? It sounds like you've done it. I mean, in the way you expressed the question, there was almost the answer in there you know, about how, <laughs> <laughs> really, really. Uh, so the way it's explained is this. Um, we have, uh, you know, six, six bardos, they're called. And the first one is uh, waking state. The second one is sleep and dream. And all six bardos are quite different states of mind consciousness. They really are different. Uh, it's not just variations of within uh, the possibilities. So why are they different? How are they different? Um, the way dream, dream is generated and the way waking state is generated, it's explained exactly the same. Seventh consciousness is pulling experience out of the eighth consciousness box of possibilities. So we yeah. have our minds conditioning with all the possibilities in there. And there's some mechanism which sequences them. So it's the sequencing mechanism for our programming. Uh, but uh, we have 
So if we call that karma, we have stronger karmas and weaker karmas. So dream is usually explained as uh, very weak karma. So it doesn't last long and we can get over it once we, once we wake up. Uh, whereas daytime reality is uh, longer lasting, more powerful karma, and that takes uh, a lot of work. But the mechanism is the same. The experience, uh, the sensorial experience, the habitual way we react to it um, is similar mechanism. There's an interesting difference in the power of habits. For instance, let's say you do lots and lots of Om Mani Padme Hum. In your daily life, you might be doing lots, lots of Om Mani Padme Hum as you walk around the town. But there'll come a time when for the first time in a dream, something happens and you say Om Mani Padme Hum. So the daytime habits take a while to percolate to that other area of the eighth consciousness, if we put it like that, which is where the dream experiences come from. And then dream experiences can also draw on past lives more easily than we can in the waking state. So, but the mechanism is similar. The reason, not the reason, the, the karmic difference is that at nighttime in dream, you are 100% in your own head, in your own mind. That's why we can change dreams. And people who do lucid dreaming can transform the reality. But even the best lucid dreamer in the daytime can't put an end to the war in the Ukraine. They can't stop the neighbor next door from doing what they do. You know, we cannot control other in the waking state because we are in connected experience with other, with all the other beings in this universe. And, other life. So there is a, a, a real quantum difference between dream reality, where we're all power, can be all powerful, and everyday reality, where we're just one tiny part of the whole. So the sequencing power of seventh consciousness to pull on experience is also related to the daytime karma, nighttime karma. Uh, but I think what you've done, I mean, the, in the teachings on the six bardos, it says, what is the main use of dream? Is dream helps us understand how illusory waking state is, even though normally in the waking state, we make it far too solid, far too concretized. So dream shows us. And so in that hinterland, either waking up in the morning or sometimes at night when we fall asleep, you can just learn from it if you can stay, uh, if you can not wake up too quickly or not fall asleep too quickly. I remember one course in, in Sami Ling where Akon Rinpoche uh, had us all on chairs and he said, now I want you to fall asleep mindfully. And so we had to, to sleep, which was best we could to sleep but to remain mindful for as many moments as we could until you actually lost consciousness. And it was very much like you explained. You, know, you can learn beyond words. I think it's this thing I was saying earlier about there's the raw, direct experience, and there's the blah, blah, blah. It's in that moment of waking that we get a raw experience about the I can say the illusory nature of daytime experience. Hi Ken. <coughs> Hi Ken. Hi Charlie. Yeah. <coughs> I've just uh, on that just got uh, an experience of mine. My my uh, <coughs> my last stroke uh, damaged the. It was a mid-brain stroke and it damaged the visual cortex. And after an early days of the stroke, I had this condition, developed this condition called Charles Bonnet syndrome, hmm. which uh, meant uh, I was experiencing uh, visual hallucinations. 
Mm. Like, uh, for example, people walking through the room, mm. animals running about, you know, and not many doctors or anything uh, had much explanation for this. But uh, I managed to see Drupal mm. and he, he understood it completely. Mm. And, and you know, he, re he really did. And he says, don't think you're having some insight or supernatural. He says, it's not that, you know? And it's simply like how we normally operate, like uh, because there's a, there was a big blank in my vision, there was just a big black hole in my vision, uh, my brain or my mind was filling in and giving me, mm. giving me this, you know. It's, it's, settled, it's settled down since now, but it can be quite alarming for people. People can have like brick walls in front of them, just mm. appearing, you know. It's called Charles Bonney syndrome because it was after a man called Charles Bonney who had first talked about this syndrome, but... It was really weird and it's really, really lucid. The, the hallucinations were really lucid. And for me, which was quite comical in a way, it was like the 1960s uh, football players that were uh, appearing. Quite lucid. And well, but imagine Bobby Moore appearing in your living room. Did you get his signature, Charlie? <laughs> but the good news was they weren't frightening and they did, they're not audio. They, they, they don't speak. Yeah. Uh, but the, the Drupon was saying, you know, he, you know, he, he wasn't surprised at all. He, you know, he, he got it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's like what we're talking about, really. You know? mm, it is, yeah. Some... The only thing is, uh, what, what we maybe find is a solid reality and we don't realise that we're, we're actually projecting mm. these things. That this, is a, this was just the, the, the mind doing another form of projection, creating its own projection. Absolutely. And, you know, there's uh, not many people did it, but in Tibet, they had things called dark retreats where you do 49 days, if you can, uh, in the dark, total dark. I mean, they really go to great lengths. So there's not one chink of light and then you don't have contact with anybody. So it only takes a couple of days for the hallucinations to start like that because it's not damage to the visual cortex, but you don't have any visual input. So then your mind, imagination, and uh, or whatever it is that does it, will uh, start making experiences. So it's one way people train for the Bardo experiences um, after life. And there are many, many funny stories for that. Uh, one, the one that Akon Rinpoche used to say, because he had there was a dark retreat in Domalakon, and um, he said, one person who'd been in there for a while. And you have an attendant. Now, they don't usually have to do very much because the whole idea is you have, it's only in case of emergency or that person leaves your food once a day. And so he screamed out that he'd caught a leopard, you know, snow leopard. The snow leopard had come into the retreat. And he said, I've got it. I'm holding it. Come in here quickly. You've got to help me. And so the guy ran in. And he's clutching his knee like this, very, very tightly, thinking it was a leopard, snow leopard, that had come in. So sure, these are these are wonderful experiences, yeah. and you know, there's so much to be said about that. And uh, when I was younger, you know, the LSD days of uh, the 1960s, and the sort of mixed thing, because. For some people, just the whole way reality can shift like that was enough to prove the point of how pickled we are in a very fixed reality. But of course, uh, plant medicines, drugs are a very, very dangerous path to follow. So isn't, and if it wasn't so dangerous, it might be a very good idea to just take everybody for one or two trips like that, just so that they, they get the point, but you quite, never quite know whether they're going to come back or how they're going to come back. So uh, maybe not. I remember uh, a student asked, Lama, you know, Lama Tupton Yeshi, one of the first Lamas to come mm. to the West. Mm. And I asked him in that LSD period, 
he, he said, I heard if you, you, if you took LST, you could be in, in, in the bardo and you could, you know, you could experience the bardo. And, his, and Lama's reply was, yes, you take LSD, you'll be in the bardo soon enough. <laughs> 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 I, I knew one guy who would, he had a, a dark attic, a windowless attic in the house, and he'd take LSD and the Tibetan Book of the Dead up there, and uh, Scary. it wasn't very healthy. I wouldn't recommend it. Anyway. Okay, well, yeah. I think... Jim, this, good morning. Oh, Anne, hello. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. I don't have a content question, but I'm intrigued for uh, since a while now by the book right behind you called Mahamudra. Mm. Um, but I can't read the subtitles, so <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> the Ocean of Definitive Meaning. It's ah, the, okay. It's the, <laughs> that's the full title of the Tibetan text. Chachen Me Don Jomso. So this book, I don't know these days, but uh, at the time it was for, uh, it wasn't publicly distributed. Mm -hmm. It's very, very well translated and it was for people who are following Mahamudra training. Uh, the main reason being that the actual book itself is a teacher's book. It's not a, just a text, it's, it's for Mahamudra teachers. And if the student gets their hands on that, in the wrong way, especially the second part of it, mm -hmm. it's going to spoil your chances because when there are some things in their questions and responses uh, that need to take you off your guard, <laughs> you need to okay. hear them and receive them for the first time. Um, I hear you. <laughs> things like that. So <laughs> Thank it's, you. it's restricted. Thanks. Okay, well, we've done the dedications. I just wish you all a very, very good week and all the best. Be, be well, be safe. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ken. Bye. 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 Thanks, Ken. Bye. Thanks, Ken. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Ken.